Chapter 3 Cole stared sullenly into the fire, then let his gaze wander. He had wanted revenge, but felt little joy from this act. Overhead, eagles drifted on the air currents. In the bay, a mother seal played with her spotted pups as a golden sun peeked through the gray overcast and glinted off the waves. This place sucks, Cole mumbled as the breeze drifted sparks upward like wandering stars. He stared back into the crackling, red-hot flames, and his anger burned. Cole rocked back and forth on his feet. Nobody cared about him. Nobody understood him. Nobody knew what it was like living with parents who wished he wasn't alive. It angered Cole when people pretended they did. His parole officer was one of those people. Once, Garvey had shown up at the detention center on his day off wearing cutoffs and a t-shirt. He carried a brown paper grocery bag. Without saying hello, he set the bag on the small concrete table in Cole's cell and sat himself down on the edge of the bed. So, he said, tell me exactly what it is you don't like about your life. Any moron can figure that out, Cole grumbled, turning his back on Garvey. In the summer's stifling heat, the room seemed airless and threatening. Okay, explain it to this moron, Garvey said. I'm pretty dense, you know. Your police file makes for pretty dull reading. Not wanting to sit anywhere near Garvey, Cole slouched to the floor against the wall. You don't get it, do you? My parents are divorced and don't give a rat if I live or die. All they care about is themselves. Nobody cares about me. All my life, I've been dumped on. A lot of people can say that, Garvey said. Be more specific. Be more specific, Cole mimicked. Last year, I went out for wrestling. I had to beg my parents to come watch me. It was like they were ashamed of me. Did they ever come to see you? Yeah, after I got mad enough, and then I lost. You'd have thought I lost on purpose the way Dad acted. When Garvey didn't answer, Cole said, So, have you heard enough? I'm still listening. Cole didn't know why he was spilling his guts to Garvey, but he fought back tears as he continued. All my parents do is drink. They hate me. Do you know what it's like waking up every morning knowing you're not good enough? There are only two things wrong with me. Everything I do and everything I say. They'll never be happy until I'm dead. After an awkward silence, Garvey eyed Cole. He spoke quietly. There's still one thing more, isn't there? Cole hesitated. It's none of your business. I know how you're feeling, Garvey said. Cole leaped to his feet and glared at Garvey. You don't know how I'm feeling, he shouted. You don't know what it's like being hit over and over until you're so numb you don't feel anything. Garvey nodded slowly. I do know what that's like. Is it your dad who hits you? Cole turned to face the wall. He drinks until he turns into a monster. Mom just gets drunk and pretends nothing has happened. It's like a bad dream I can't wake up from. Garvey stood up and reached into the brown paper bag he had brought with him. One by one, he pulled out groceries and set them on the small cement table. What are you doing? Cole asked. Garvey ignored the question as he laid out salt, flour, eggs, baking soda, a little water, sugar, butter, and molasses. Cole wiped sweat from his forehead. The stuffy room felt like a furnace. Okay, said Garvey, finishing. Taste everything on the table. No way, Cole grumbled. Uh, I'm not eating that crap. You surprise me, Garvey said. You're actually afraid of a little bad taste? I'm not afraid of anything, Cole boasted, standing and approach the table, or and approaching the table. One by one, he sampled each item, tasting first the flour, sugar, the baking soda. He purposefully took big mouthfuls to prove nothing bothered him. Casually, he drank some thick molasses. He stared straight at Garvey as he bit off a chunk of butter and swallowed it. When he came to the eggs, he picked one up, tilted his head back, and broke it raw into his mouth. He downed it with a single swallow. He finished by shaking salt directly into his mouth. So, Garvey asked, did you, or how did everything taste? Gross. Cole took a long swig of water from the bottle. What'd you expect? Garvey reached back into the bag. I want you to taste one more thing. He unwrapped a small baked cake with creamy frosting and broke off a large piece. Here, he said, eat this if you dare. Cole wolfed down the moist piece of cake, eyeing Garvey the whole time. So what does all this prove? Garvey shrugged. Did you like the cake? It was okay. 
I baked it this morning using the same ingredients you tasted on the table. Yeah, so, Cole said. What ingredients should I have left out? None, Cole said. That's a dumb question. But you said the ingredients tasted gross. Cole let his irritation show. Not mixed together, stupid. Garvey stood and walked wearily to the door. His shoulders sagged forward as if tired from a long hike. Leaving the cake and all the ingredients on the table, he let himself out of the steel door without saying goodbye. Cole walked sullenly around the room, cursing. He swept his arm across the table and sent the baking ingredients flying. Eggs smashed, wrappers broke open, wrappings broke open, plastic containers ricocheted off the wall. In seconds, the small room looked bombed. Cole kicked at the butter, flour, sugar, and baking soda. Sticky molasses and egg whites coated his shoes as he picked up the cake and flung it hard at the steel door. This cake sucks, he shouted, and so does my life. Inch by inch, the billowing flames devoured the supplies and the shelter. Cole chuckled, then laughed out loud. As the searing flames surged and rolled higher along the sides of the shelter, his laughter grew hysterical. By the time the flames engulfed the wooden hut and licked up into the open air, Cole had lost all control. His wild laughter mocked the world and everyone he had ever known. It mocked the loneliness. It mocked every bully he, that had ever picked on him. He laughed at every time he had ever been teased, every time he'd been arrested, every time his parents had argued. He laughed at all the times he'd been beaten by his drunken father or been ignored by his drunken mother. These were the ingredients in his cake, and they, and they sucked. Cole didn't care anymore. His life was beyond caring. With Cole's laughter, hot tears escaped his reddened and angry eyes and flooded his cheeks. This banishment was the ultimate hurt, worse than his father's fists and belt, worse than his mother's never caring. This was the hurt of being alone and unwanted. The flames of the burning shelter rumbled like a freight train and sucked at the air. Thick smoke poured from the doorway and boiled upward from the blaze. Still, Cole kept laughing like a madman. Not until the flames began to subside did his maniac or did his manic laughter fade. Only then did he leave, did he let his attention stray from the fire. The first thing he saw was the atow, the brightly colored blanket given to him by Garvey. It rested unharmed in the grass nearby. Shielding his face from the burning heat, Cole snatched up at the or Cole snatched up the atow and with one swift motion flung it toward the fire. In the same motion, he turned away from the flames and ran toward the shoreline. No one in the healing circle had known how strongly he could swim, not even Garvey. The only person who knew was his father. He was the one who had forced Cole to go out for the swim team because that was because that is what he himself had done in high school. But no matter how well Cole swam, his father criticized him. You swing, you swim like you have let up your butt, he'd scream at, as Cole swam, if he managed to show up at all. Cole studied the bay as he removed his shoes and pulled off his clothes. He stood in his underwear and stared out across the waters. The boat had brought him west from Drake. Now, with the afternoon sun setting behind him, he fixed his eyes on the first island of the east. He could swim island to island stopping at each to warm up, eat, and sleep. Sooner or later, there would be a passing boat to take him back to the mainland. Nobody would ever find him, and no one would ever again tell him what to do. Cole waded into the light surf. His breath caught when the waves reached his chest. The icy, transparent water was colder than he had expected, but he plunged forward and began stroking. He knew he could not survive forever in the frigid water. Every minute, count, every minute counted now and he needed to swim hard. Rhythmically, he reached out, each stroke taking him further away from the island prison. As Cole swam, he thought about Garvey and the stupid cake demonstration, and he thought about his application for circle justice. It had been a full three weeks since he'd submitted the application before Garvey had casually said, well, champ, you've been accepted for circle justice. Uh, now what are you gonna do with this chance? It's about time. I hope the committee knows what they're getting into, Garvey said. This was your idea, Cole shot back. Garvey nodded. So are you going to disappoint them? Don't worry about me, Cole said. How soon can I get out of this stinkhole? 
First, the keepers will prepare for the hearing circle where everybody gets together to look for solutions. Who exactly will be there? Anybody who wants to help. Who would want to help me? Might be your parents, the lawyers, the judge, myself, community members, maybe even your classmates at school. Anybody can be a part of the circle if they want to help find a solution. My parents, that's a joke, Cole scoffed. They don't know if I, or they don't care if I'm dead or alive. When Garvey didn't answer, Cole said, will Peter be there? Garvey shrugged. It's up to him. He may or may not be ready to forgive you. I don't care if he, for, I don't care if he forgives me. Garvey rubbed the back of his neck, then glancing up towards the ceiling. How come everything is always about you? This forgiveness isn't for you. Until Peter forgives you, he won't heal. Maybe if he forgives me, everyone will forget about what I did and I can get out of this pit faster. Garvey stood to leave. Forgiving isn't forgetting, chump.